This is a CBC Podcast. Hi, I'm Bernice Hillier, and this is CBC Newfoundland Morning On Demand for Tuesday, July 27th. Coming up on today's show, after a five-year ordeal, fertility advocate LaDawn Wellen is finally expecting her first child. But her fight for more fertility services in this province isn't over. We'll hear from her. And more transparency and more accountability. We'll hear from a group advocating for a civilian oversight board for police in this province. Plus, Mike Martin's mystery series has gained a following. Now the Ottawa-based writer is coming home to Newfoundland and Labrador for some new inspiration. We'll speak with the author. And Where Did You Go? That's the name of the debut single from Yvette Lorraine, known to Newfoundland audiences as singer Yvette Coleman. We'll talk to her and play her song this morning. Now for an update on a story we first brought you last year about the fight for better access to fertility services in this province. LaDawn Wellen has a medical condition that affects her ability to get pregnant and shortens her window for having children. Last year, she started the online group Faces of Fertility to shine a light on those who face fertility issues, including a lack of in vitro fertilization services here in this province. And while changes in the provincial health care system are slow to come, LaDawn Wellen did receive some good news earlier this year. She is going to be having a baby. LaDawn joins me on the line this morning. Good morning to you. Good morning. Well, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. What has the journey been like for you from first trying to access fertility services up to the present day? Um, I mean, it's been five years since we started trying to uh, have a child. So it's been a long journey. Um, A lot of hurdles in the way, especially financially, because it's so expensive to access fertility treatments. Um, The doctors here are wonderful. They just don't have enough access to what they need to be able to offer the full spectrum of fertility treatments. You actually went to Western Canada at one point, right? Yeah. So last year, um, actually at the beginning of March, I went to Calgary for IVF and got stuck up there during the pandemic. So yeah, I went all the way up there and I was there for over a month. How much did the pandemic affect your ability to get the services you need? You know, how much of, I guess, the challenges that you ran into were the result of COVID restrictions as opposed to what would normally have been the case? Well, normally, um, you know, you call into the clinic, you get an appointment right away, and you can start a treatment as soon as you'd like. Um, That's what happened when I was going to Calgary. I you know, I called in, I started when I was able to, um, but then I had my embryos made in Calgary and then I couldn't get back to them because of the travel. So, you know, I paid almost $30,000 to have embryos made through IVF and then I had no access to them being in Newfoundland. So for over a year, I, I just kind of was at a standstill. I had no access to anything. What finally worked for you? What do you, you know, uh, to what do you attribute your success? Um, I think it's all just kind of luck. Um, You know, I did 10 IUIs and the 10th one worked. IVF didn't work for me. Um, But I was just so fed up with not being able to get back to Calgary to pursue IVF again that I tried um, one more IUI and it happened to work. So... You know, it's it's science, but it's also it's also luck. And the doctors here were fantastic and let me do another IUI, even though usually after two or three, they kind of say like they might not work um, because there's such a low success rate for what we have in the province. So, you know, IVF is much more successful. And I had done nine IUIs before and, you know, they're expensive and they're hard on the body and... They let me do one more, and it just happened to work. 
Well, we're very happy for you, Ladon, for sure. Now, your advocacy with the Faces of Fertility Group has brought a lot of attention uh, to this <laughs> issue. And back in January, the Liberals said they would be looking into in vitro fertilization services in this province. Have you heard anything since then about where that stands? Not really. Um, there hasn't been much movement. I haven't heard anything. I I really hoped that I would. Um, I know that, you know, the promise of an IVF clinic wasn't going to mean that there was going to be a clinic open up the next month or anything. Um, but we were told that there would be funding for travel in the interim. I haven't heard anything about that. And I don't think there's been many meetings or anything been pushing forward. Um, I recently heard that they said they were going to explore the option of IVF instead of actually bringing it here, where the promises sounded more like they were actually going to bring it here. How do you feel about that? Is that the progress you'd wanted to see? Obviously not. Definitely not. Um, I mean, we had been promised it before. Apparently in 2016, there was a promise on the political agenda to bring it here and nothing ever happened. So I don't plan on giving up until it's actually here, but I just uh, hope that would be sooner rather than later. You're also part of a national committee fighting for fertility equality. What's happening on the national stage to break down barriers for people facing fertility issues? Um, Right now, so I work with, uh, I'm working with Fertility Matters. Um, We have a group called East Coast Miracles right now that we're working with the Atlantic provinces to try to get uh, fertility equality. Um, So currently, there's an election in Nova Scotia. Um, They already have access to IVF in their province. So right now, we're working on getting funding um, since it should be a part of, you know, just regular health care. Now that you're expecting a child, will you continue your advocacy? Oh, definitely. Um, You know, if someone had done this and kept going with it and fighting years ago, then I wouldn't have had to. You know, I might already have a child or two by now. Um, and you know, my children might need it. So I'm, I'm going to keep going until, until I see the results that, that Newfoundlanders need. Ladon, do you have any advice for others who are in the same situation in which you found yourself over the past few years? Um, it's a really hard journey to go through. Um, if you're willing to be open about it, it is so liberating. Uh, society kind of tells you to kind of keep it hush hush, but, when I opened up about it, I uh, I felt so much better because there's so many people going through it. You know, it's it's over one in six people in Canada that have fertility issues, and so you're definitely not alone. Ladon, may I ask when your baby is due? Halloween. Oh, really? Wow, that's yeah. wonderful. Well, <laughs> congratulations once again, and thank you for taking some time to speak with us this morning. Thank you so much for having me. That is LaDawn Wellen. She's a fertility advocate and a mother-to-be. A new group in this province wants civilians to have more oversight over the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary. In many parts of Canada, police forces are directly accountable to civilian bodies, but not here in this province. Caitlin Ur- Caitlin Urquhart wants to change that. She is a lawyer and she's the co-chair of the First Voice Working Group on Police Oversight. Caitlin Urquhart joins me on the line this morning. Good morning to you, Caitlin. Good morning, Bernie. Well, we first heard of this working group back in June, and now since then, CBC has reported extensively on allegations within the RNC of sexual assault. When you heard about these most recent allegations, what were your initial thoughts? I mean, firstly, of course, um, a great deal of empathy and, uh, you know, inspiration from these survivors who've had the strength and courage to come forward uh, and just that we want to to honor and respect their story. Um, and, and that, of course, this really goes to show exactly the types of issues that the Missing and Murdered uh, Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry found, um, the, the calls to, for justice 5.7 um, and 9.2 are the reason that we are 
uh, that we've established this working group because it, we know that there are systemic issues within policing across this country that lead to, unfortunately, disproportionate outcomes um, and, and real harm for women and girls, and particularly Indigenous and racialized women and girls. In your opinion, what's the biggest problem we're facing right now with policing and accountability in Newfoundland and Labrador? So um, unlike men, most jurisdictions really across the country, we do not have a uh, civilian-led oversight body. The chief of police reports directly to the Minister of Justice. And now, of course, given that the Minister of Justice is a political position, um, that uh, the, the extent to which a minister can really direct the policy um, of the police is fairly limited. So in many other jurisdictions, we see a board, much like what you would see a board of directors that people are, are fairly familiar with. Um, but we're looking, and we haven't exactly presupposed the outcome because our working group is intended to, to set out some discussion, and we're going to put it in a discussion paper and then get input but some form of, of oversight board that can provide that uh, proactive, systemic um, oversight. So they would set policy on things like use of force. They would set policy around things like whether or not you could, you know, uh, go down to George Street and pick people up for uh, to drive them home. You know, some of these these questions, some questions that arose out of out of the Snellgrove trial about lack of policy in certain areas, um, as as well as the recent uh, Andrew Abbas situation. Like there are a number of examples that we can point to of where these the lack of that oversight uh, has had real life consequences for people in this province. And uh, unfortunately, actually, we're just really quite a bit behind the, the game in terms of what's, what exists across the country. However, that gives us a really interesting opportunity to do something that's tailor-made for Newfoundland and Labrador that works for the people here to create accountability and transparency and to help to rebuild that trust that has been so fundamentally broken. What kind of difference could it make to uh, the lives of all of us who are policed in this province, but also uh, to police officers as well, if they had this kind of civilian oversight in place? Well, I mean, uh, of course, I think that it's, it's really helpful for everyone, right? Um, from the sort of basics of if you know, if you work in an organization that has robust policies that really help to guide you to make sure that you're doing, um, you're able to do your work and that your colleagues do their, you know, are able to as well. Everyone has that base knowledge. They know what their, what the expectations are and that's really helpful. Um, but also uh, we know that, that often policing can be, quite a scary job uh, and if you're interacting with a group or an individual that doesn't have a trust in you and maybe even has some animosity towards you as a result of past experience experiences um, rebuilding that trust can actually make it a much safer place to to work for police officers so uh, as well it creates that bar that barrier or that boundary between uh, sort of the justice minister and the um, the, um, sorry, and the chief of police. So um, that's, you know, it, it creates that buffer as well and, and, and gives transparency and accountability to the, uh, to the people of the province. Caitlin, I understand that since you've announced the intention of this committee, you've met with the justice minister. How did that meeting go? So we were glad uh, to, you know, that, that the minister gave us the opportunity and the time to meet with him. And certainly uh, he and his staff were quite open to our suggestions and recommendations. Uh, however, we didn't get any hard commitments. Um, we haven't seen any sort of strong statement about a commitment to implementing the calls for justice of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry, um, and particularly the two that we're looking at, 5.7 and 9.2. And so that's sort of the, the next step. And we're really hoping that in the future um, that that openness that we saw will actually turn into a real commitment to bringing this province up to uh, the level that we need it and to having a civilian-led uh, police oversight body 
and following hopefully the recommendations that that come out of our organization, of our working group uh, in the future. And when can we expect something more from your working group in terms of a report, uh, you know, telling people what you do want to see? So that's a great question, and thank you. Um, we will uh, fairly soon we'll be releasing a discussion paper, and with that, um, we are hoping for broad engagement across community. Any certainly anyone who has experienced police violence, or um, who is a family uh, member of someone who's experienced police violence, but as well anyone from a marginalized community, and really anyone uh, in the province is welcome to engage in that process. It will be putting out some ideas and then taking that feedback um, in order to develop our final recommendations for what a Newfoundland and Labrador uh, sort of based civilian-led oversight body could look like. We want to create that ac- accountability and that transparency and that broader systemic policy-based view. So, um we want to know what people think would best uh, could best do that in this province. So we'll be looking to to hear from folks and then uh, aim to have our recommendations out by the end of the year. All right. Well, Caitlin, keep in touch with us about uh, this certainly very interesting work that you're doing. Thanks so much. Thank you. That is Caitlin Urquhart. She is a lawyer and the co-chair of the First Voice Working Group on Police Oversight. <music> There have been many happy homecomings in recent weeks since Newfoundland and Labrador reopened to travelers from across Canada, and there will be another happy homecoming soon when my next guest arrives in the province. And since he's a writer, Mike Martin will likely also be looking for some new inspiration. Mike Martin is originally from Newfoundland, but he lives in Ottawa, and this past spring he released his most recent book in his Sergeant Windflower mystery series. Mike Martin joins me on the line from Ottawa this morning. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Bernice. Great to be with you. Well, it's great to have you with us. When are you headed this way? A couple more days, a couple more sleeps. <laughs> we, uh, we, I think uh, we're leaving on, uh, leaving from Ottawa on Sunday and then uh, crossing over on the ferry sometime during the week and then we'll be on the island and then in Grand Bank, we hope, uh, by later in uh, na- later next week. And Grand Bank is home for you, is that right? St. John's is my original home. St. John's. Grand Bank is my adopted home in Newfoundland now. That's where my uh, partner's family is from, and uh, that's where we have spent, prior to that pandemic, we have spent most summers uh, for the last 10, 12 years. Wow. Well, I want to, you know, uh, for the benefit of all of our listeners who might not be familiar with this mystery series, just remind us who Sergeant Windflower is. Well, Sergeant Windflower is an RCMP officer who gets transferred into Newfoundland in the Grand Bank. He's from northern Alberta. He's actually a Cree um, um, you know, born a Cree in a, in a reserve in northern Alberta, joined the RCMP. And anyway, he, he ends up stationed in Grand Bank. And that's where the story begins. Um, and he's managed to stay in Grand Bank now for almost uh, 10, 11 years. And, uh, and so he, even though he's from away, and even though his background's completely different, he falls in love with Newfoundland, falls in love with a Newfoundland girl, uh, ends up getting married, and the story goes on from there. When you created his character in the first book, did you know he had a series in him? No, I I just wanted to write a book. Uh, I think every writer, uh, whatever kind of writer you are, wants to write a book. And so my ambition was to write a book. And I remember being near the end of the book, or what I thought was the end of the book, but I couldn't seem to find an ending that would sort of close off the whole thing. And my partner, who's the mystery fan in, in in the family, she said, why don't you make it a series? And that's how the rest of the books got born. Now, I don't think you're a retired RCMP officer. Am I right about that? You are absolutely correct. So how much research do you have to do for any of your books? Well, I, I do lots of research. Um, but, I mean, the thing about it is the information is readily available now. I don't go too far into the uh, technical details of police procedures. I just try to make sure what information I do provide is correct. But, you know, uh, Mr. Google will give you almost anything you need right now. 
You are a freelance writer who also does other types of writing uh, in addition to mystery writing. Which would you say is your bread and butter, the the mysteries or, or what what would you say about that? Well, I would say that, you know, my uh, my business writing, my freelance writing uh, and the communications work I, I do pays my bills and the creative writing, the fiction writing is the fun part of my life. Yeah, for sure. It's your passion, is it? Absolutely. I mean, I, it's different kinds of writing because the the business writing, uh, as you know um, from your experience, uh, it comes from your head and it's memory and it's, uh, you know, um, a, a, using a different set of uh, tools. But the creative writing actually comes from your heart. It's kind of inside you and, and you have to find that creative flow, the creative spirit uh, and write from there. And uh, And that's a lot more fun than sitting down writing a policy brief. For sure. This latest book, uh, Safe Harbor, is set in St. John's, in, so in your hometown, but your books are always tied in some way to Grand Bank. How important is your link to that place, to the inspiration you get for your writing? Well, I mean, Grand Bank has a history of its own. It's a, it's a, uh, it, the more you dig into Grand Bank uh, and its story, the more fascinating it is, uh, because, of course, it was... Um, it's always been sort of an international type city uh, or town where people came and went from all over the world. Uh, it was the home of the Grand Banks fishery, uh, which was the salt fishery, which was, you know, the uh, the mainstay of Newfoundland for hundreds of years. Um, and, of course, it has a little bit of an underbelly with the smuggling from St. Pierre and Miquelon in the area. And uh, so it has it has a lot of flavor that can add to a mystery story. And uh, and I keep finding stories every time I go visit. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. I mean, you haven't been home in two years now. So what's it been like for you as a writer to not get home to the place that has influenced your writing? Well, it's, it just means you have to find different sources of inspiration. Um, but I I, I, I I must say, I was really at a loss when we couldn't get down um, the first year of the pandemic because I didn't know if I would find inspiration because... Every time I go to Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, particularly if I go to the Grand Bank area in the South Coast, I always hear a story or a piece of uh, an, uh, an item on the news, and that will give me the starting point for a story. And so, you know, the uh, the fact of not being there, I was worried that I wouldn't find it. But I did have a couple, I guess, a couple left in my memory banks that uh, that I was able to write from. And this book is, is uh, the latest book is set in St. John's, which is, kind of fun in itself because I haven't written much about St. John's, so it's kind of nice to write about your hometown as well. Yeah. I don't want to make people paranoid to talk to you now, Mike, while you're home, but uh, <laughs> are you literally always listening for ideas or snippets of inspiration for your next book? See, here's the deal. People love to tell their stories, and they and some of the stories have been around forever. Uh, there's a great story, for example, um, the, there's an old B&B in Grand Bank, and it, I use it as a model for another B&B that Windflower and his wife uh, bought. And the story was that there was a ghost in the uh, in the B&B, and people, I heard the story of the ghost, and apparently it was the wife of the uh, owner, because when they set up the place, they set it up as a personal house, but then they started renting out rooms because there was no nowhere else for people to stay. And so every night when people would come, they could ask for whatever room they want, and, and the skipper and his missus would move around. So they never had a place to sleep, uh, never had their own bedroom. And so the story was that, that the ghost would wander around the house every night to look for a place to sleep. And so I found a way to wind that into a story, not the main story, but a, it's kind of an example of people love to tell that story. Whether it's true or not doesn't really matter. It's a great story. Yeah, absolutely. Without giving too much away, I want to give you an opportunity to give us a hint of the mystery that Sergeant Windflower has to solve in Safe Harbor. Well, in Safe Harbor, the um, he ends up in St. John's, which is kind of foreign territory to him, which most people from this land will recognize. He doesn't like the traffic. He doesn't like the noise. Uh, he's really out of place and because he's, get, he's really used to living in a, in a small community. And so he has a new job. Uh, he has the challenges of all that. And uh, But he sees a poster of a missing girl uh, on a telephone pole. And then he sees another poster. Uh, and the girl, the second girl he sees, is from the Grand Bank area. And that gets his attention, so he starts 
digging into that and uh, and before long he's uh, he's investigating uh these missing girls and so that's the sort of mystery behind the story but the story like all the windflower mysteries are really about a man and you know finding his way in a new community he has a young family he's growing as a person growing as a father um and so it's more the human element the human story that uh that's the key to the sergeant windflower mysteries and Nobody will be frightened. There's no bad language. Uh, it's a great light mystery that uh, people can take with them and sit on the beach and watch the ocean roll in. Do you think it's time for Sergeant Windflower to get reassigned maybe to a posting in western Newfoundland? Well, I, he has a big decision to make because he's at the place now where he's, sort of, he's, he's strung out his day in Grand Bay as long as he can. And so now he has to make a decision about whether he gets relocated, and he's looking at other places around the province, or whether he leaves the RCMP. So that'll be another book in the series. Mike, I'm just trying to get you to come to central or western Newfoundland to, you know, spend part of your vacation maybe some year. I We love west the West Coast. Um, you know, we haven't been able to get to um, uh, to Gross Morn for the last couple of years, and I really miss that. I I find that it's one one of the most magical places in the world, and I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to promote it too much because I want to save it for us. Because the uh, the uh, and certainly I love when we're driving along the highway and we come into uh, the Cornerbrook area. That is one of the most beautiful places in the world. So, yes, we're going to be out there to visit and. Um, Maybe even drop in to see you. All right. We'd love to see you. Thanks so much, Mike, for this this morning. Thank you, Bernice. familiar name and face in the music scene of Western Newfoundland is making fresh waves in the music business. Yvette Coleman has been a regular performer at Grossmorn Summer Music over the years. She's recorded with the artist Bridges as St. Eve. And now this week, she is dropping her own debut single as a solo artist. Where Did You Go is being released under the performance name Yvette Lorraine. And that song will make its CBC radio premiere in a few moments from now here on CBC Newfoundland Morning. Right now, we are joined by Yvette Lorraine. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me today. Well, thank you for joining us. You've been making music for quite a while, probably all of your life, but this is your de- <laughs> debut single now as a solo artist. So tell That's us right. a little bit about the journey that brought you to this point. Yeah, um, I, I guess I've been writing for five years now. Uh, as as you know, I think I did a a lot of classical music in my lifetime, and um, went away to study uh, opera and classical art song. But decided uh, shortly after I graduated that that wasn't um, everything I was interested in. I still love it, but I found myself kind of starting to write my own uh, my own music and um yeah it's kind of it's led me here <laughs> so 5 years later uh doing my own solo artist project and um learning a lot on the way <laughs> we're going to play your debut single in a few minutes from now but tell us a bit about the story behind where did you go where did you go um was I mean I wrote it a little bit after St. Eve's split up and um I started to develop my own sound and uh work with various producers and writers, some in LA, some in Toronto. Specifically, um the producer of this track is Shia Matamid and he's a producer in Toronto. He's an amazing musician. Um 
So he and I started this song, and he kind of just let me go into the in the vocal booth, and he said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna leave for a bit and uh, just be yourself." And and I had never kind of had the the room to myself fully in a in a session before. Always it was, you know, you kind of you're with that person all the time or you're bouncing ideas back and forth. But I remember this one being uniquely different because I was isolated in the booth and also in the room. Um, And I think what I realized was it just allowed me to really speak freely um, and without, you know, without any concern that it it wasn't a great lyric or it, it was, you know, all those insecurities that you have putting ideas and feelings out there in front of other people that um, also you don't know too well. Um, So Where Did You Go was about, for me, it was just about talking to myself differently. It was about having um, different conversations with myself and recognizing myself differently. Um, Not always in the best way, you know, you, you, you lose yourself sometimes in your journey and um i guess it may come off like i'm talking to someone in this in this song but really it was it was directed towards myself um i think that that might clarify some of the lyrics there uh like in the second verse or what have you i think you can kind of start to understand that it is a self-reflection piece so yeah on the journey what's it been like trying to find or to decide on what sound was yours you talked about you know that classical and opera although you still love them that's not everything you're interested in anymore how do you find your sound and how do you do that as a singer in today's really high pressure music industry Mm -hmm. I think as as soon as I stopped trying to find it I found it (laughs) As, as soon as I stopped trying so hard uh, to figure it out and you know what artist I was going to be and all those things um, that was only blocking me from my true kind of self-expression so what helped me was was the moment that I kind of let go of it all and just listened to the music I loved um, and only that I loved and then uh, took from took from that took inspiration from that but also felt free to write all over the map. I I always was concerned that um that I was a little bit too you know um in involved in so many different genres of music that I didn't have that distinct sound that an artist is supposed to have, but after a while I just I decided I I really I think it it hit me when covid hit um that it's it's important for me to continue to sing and continue to write. So that helped me found my sound was just to stop trying so hard to figure it out and just continue to create every day and and each creation allow it to be different and allow it to be unique and you know not tied up in a in a bow. Um, so yeah, that, I don't know if that helps but absolutely <laughs> so I can explain it and we should tell people you have an EP coming out the single we're yeah. about to play technically drops on Thursday of this week but you have an EP yeah. and I've been told that each one of the tracks on your upcoming EP demonstrates your vocal range in different ways how are you feeling about launching this out into the world it's uh, it's just such a relief actually because I've, I've I've had so much you know that I've been sitting on for a while and I feel really ready to just you know let it live somewhere else um other than with me uh but each song is very different and I think it does celebrate versatility and um it was a part of my accepting of of that 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 was a part of me um but I, I do feel really excited. I have a great team uh, that I've been working with in Toronto. I think that you've been in touch with, but they've been amazing on this journey. And um, each track is a different producer and a different group of artists that I've worked with. 
um, including Chris Kirby and the family um, that we did some sessions with in Halifax. And that included Ian Sherwood, the Rini, Rini and um, the Smith sisters. Um, and we just had a fabulous time in Halifax uh, putting together some live tracks. So there'll be some live recordings as well in the EP. And, e- Yvette, um, I'm yeah. afraid we're going to have to leave it there because we want to play your song this morning yes, on CBC Radio 1. And we're quickly running out of time. Thank you so much for speaking with us this morning. Oh, thank you so much for having me. That's Yvette I Lorraine. Appreciate it. Best known to audiences in Western Newfoundland as Yvette Coleman, but get used to that name. Yvette Lorraine here in a CBC radio premiere is her debut single as a solo artist. This is Where Did You Go? Wake up with the best intentions Making so many promises I'll probably end up breaking Caught up in my feelings I try to pull myself together Don't know where all the pieces went Off in a world All on my own Trying to get back to the one I lost Trying to get back to the one I was Where did you go? That's Yvette Lorraine, and in a CBC radio premiere, that is her debut single, Where Did You Go?, her debut single. As a solo artist, Yvette Lorraine, better known to audiences in Western Newfoundland, of course, as Yvette Coleman. The single actually drops on Thursday of this week, so download it, stream it, uh, get it wherever you get your music coming up on Thursday of this week, and watch for her upcoming EP. That's the on-demand version of CBC Newfoundland Morning for Tuesday, July 27th. Thanks for listening. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.